On last Friday's program, we discussed different substitutions you can make to get that blood sugar down. Today, we're going to give you a whole bunch more substitutions. When you realize that you're diabetic or you're pre-diabetic or you just simply want to get your health in line with where it should be, you realize also that you're going to have to make some changes in the foods that you eat. Part of it means you're going to not allow certain foods that you used to eat to come into your mouth, and the other part means you're going to have to add new foods as part of your diet. So today we're going to give you some more substitutions, a whole bunch of them. We're going to look at the standard diet and some of the foods you eat on a standard diet and show that those are the bad guys. Those are the things that are getting you into this terrible place you are in with high glucose levels and a high A1C. And so you're going to have to slash those out of your diet and then add on some new things. So let's get started with some of the bad guys and some of the alternatives. First of all, let's go to... Pizza. This is one of the terrible bad guys, one of the nasty, horrible, no good bad guys in the American standard diet, British standard diet, practically any standard diet, at least in the Western world. What is junk food is this monstrous bread base that is made from white flour and it is a starch that is going to convert into sugar lightning fast as soon as you get it in your stomach. So you got to say goodbye to pizza, at least a normal pizza, but you can choose a low carb pizza. This is made from a low carb tortilla shell. Don't use a regular tortilla shell, even though they're thin, they're still going to have too many carbs, but a low carb tortilla shell will do the job. The ingredients are all pretty much like you'd find on any pizza, cheese and meat and mushrooms, green peppers, black olives. Look at the two different options here. This is a monster. This is a little fella. Monster, little fella. Now guess what? The little fella is going to be so much gentler on your blood sugar. Now in both cases, the topping is never the problem. Cheese is not the problem. Meat is not the problem. Sausage, not the problem. The vegetables are not the problem. The problem is the base. But if you look at how thick this base is and how thin this base is, you can see why this is gentle on your blood sugar, and you should love that idea, gentle on your blood sugar. This is harsh, radical, and will drive your blood sugar crazy. Let's go on to another bad guy. And here we have pancakes. We all love pancakes. I grew up eating pancakes like crazy. I could stuff them in, even though I was a skinny kid. On pancake morning, I could really pack in those pancakes. And of course, we never ate pancakes with just some butter on them. We had good old pancake syrup. Now, the pancake syrup by itself is terrible. This one has 26 grams of carbs for two tablespoons, but most people would probably have three, and most people would have more than these. These are fairly small pancakes, and there's only two of them. Many would have four or five and just dump the syrup on. Over 100 grams of carbs in many cases, a total monstrosity, a total nightmare for your glucose levels. But there is an alternative. And that, of course, is low-carb pancakes. These are pancakes, but they're not wheat pancakes. They're made of mostly coconut flour with a little bit of almond flour and some other ingredients like eggs and heavy cream. They are so much nicer to your blood sugar, to your metabolic system, to your health, to your body. If you have to have syrup, you could try a sugar-free syrup. I've used this before, uh, but also a lot of times, rather than do the syrup route, I'll just mash up some strawberries, maybe mix in a little cream with them and spread them over my pancakes. Add a couple of sausages, cup of coffee, makes for a beautiful Saturday morning. Life is good. Let's move on to another food that you're going to have to find a substitute for, and that is rice. We all love rice, right? And uh, practically everybody eats rice, whether you're in Africa, whether you're in the Philippines, Asia, England. Who is there any culture, any country that doesn't eat rice? 
The problem is, and it looks harmless. It's not sweet. It's, uh, it, it tastes starchy, not sweet. And yet it will spike your blood sugar tremendously. If you're wanting low glucose, this is not your friend. This is your enemy. And it has almost as many carbs, a, a fairly good size helping of rice, as a candy bar. It's just going to taste different. You're going to feel healthy. You're going to feel noble and righteous by eating rice rather than that candy bar. But the reality is it's just about as bad in terms of metabolic uh, spike, blood sugar spiking properties. So is there an alternative? Yeah, there is. We have here something that looks like rice that doesn't quite taste like rice, but you can put your stew over it, your sauce over it, and it's pretty good. In fact, usually it will soak up the stew, the sauce, and reflect that flavor. Uh, once in a while, you'll taste it. It's cauliflower rice. They've taken cauliflower and, and, and shaved it and cut it into rice. You can buy it in bags in the frozen section. But Benedicta has made a homemade version of it, and it's just perfectly acceptable. In fact, I think I like it a little bit better. So if you're in a little village somewhere where you couldn't possibly find some kind of a riced vegetable or a frozen section... Just buy some cauliflower and, and cut it into pieces, cook it up. There you go. This is a, a type of riced veggie made from broccoli. I haven't even tried this yet, but I just want you to know these things are available and there are many choices. Uh, my daughter and I made a video about um, shirataki rice. Now, I don't like shirataki noodles. I think they're nasty. They're rubbery. They make you feel like you're eating worms. But the shirataki rice has a totally different texture, and it can work. It's not exactly like rice, but it's close enough. You put some sauce over it, and you're good to go. All right, let's go to another bad guy. Good old cereal. I have always loved cereal. When I was a kid, I just could have eaten cereal every meal. If you had offered me a steak dinner with a big old baked potato and a salad, or... A bowl of cereal, I think I would have chosen the bowl of cereal. I loved it that much. And even as an adult, I ate it every chance I could get. I had many breakfasts of cereal. I had it as a snack. I had it as a late night snack. Uh, I just have always loved cereal. And it was a sad day when I had to say to cereal, my love, it's been great, but I've got to say goodbye. I, we've got to get divorced. It's just not working. It's just not working. No, we can't even be friends anymore. I've got to say goodbye. Well, that's what I did with cereal. But like so many different food items from the standard diet that are not good for you and especially not good for your blood sugar, there is an alternative. So let's check it out. I discovered the coconut chip. This is made by the Terrasol Superfoods Company. And the thing about coconut chips is they are in a flake type uh, of a shape and a flake type texture, which means it's a pretty good cereal substitute with far less carbs than a wheat-based product. So you can throw in some, some coconut chips and the same is true with sliced almonds. Sliced almonds are kind of in the form of a chip. So you can throw in some sliced almonds and then you can put in anything else you want. For example, pecans, they're not exactly in a chip shape, but they'll still work. Throw them in there. Sunflower seeds, throw them in there. So, homemade cereal. Another choice would be the chia seed pudding. pudding chia seed pudding is not exactly a cereal, but it's close. And it is also very gentle on blood sugar, and you can choose that. I made a video about that, and a lot of people have said, hey, this isn't bad at all. And I, I tested myself. It almost seemed too good to be true. It, it tastes too good, and it's got too many ingredients. Surely this is going to give my blood sugar a real ride up into the stratosphere. Didn't do it at all. Hardly budged it at all. So chia seed pudding, homemade cereal. All right, let's go to another item from the standard menu that needs to be replaced, and that is milk. You're saying, oh no, I've given up soda. I've given up orange juice. Now you're telling me I should give up milk as well? Well, there is a problem with just normal milk. And by the way, this is whole milk, which is better than uh, skim milk. Skim milk is about the worst. And a lot of people think it's the best, think they're doing themselves a favor. But milk in general has too many carbs. 
It's not as bad as soda. It's like 12 grams compared to about 30 some grams, but still it's too many. If, if you've got a limit, a strict limit on your carbs per day, you really can't afford to be pouring milk on your cereal or drinking a glass of milk. But there is an option to save carbs, and that's what the name of the game is. Save, scrimp on, and just cut down those carbs every way you can. What is that option? Heavy whipping cream. Before I went low carb and started desperately looking around for low carb recipes, I didn't know there was such a thing as heavy whipping cream. I was that ignorant, just never had heard of it, didn't know anybody that used it. And suddenly I'm finding recipes that call for heavy whipping cream or heavy cream. And lo and behold, I found it is very low in carbs and it can go a long ways. Put a little bit in your coffee and it is so much richer than regular milk. It doesn't take nearly so much. Now, should you substitute heavy whipping cream for milk? Not on a one-to-one -one basis, but here's what you can do. You can take a part heavy whipping cream, about that much or whatever you choose, and then triple, add two parts or three parts of water. So let's just raise that up quite a bit and give it a couple of stirs. It looks like milk, doesn't it? And it tastes like milk. You can make it richer by using less water, make it a little bit uh, freer and a little waterier by using more water. Experiment and find out. You don't need to use pure heavy whipping cream to make milk. Almond milk would be another choice you can use. So there are alternatives. Don't use regular milk if you can help it. You'll save on carbs. And that's what we want to do. Okay, the next bad guy we want to replace is pasta. Well, actually, I forgot to go out and buy some pasta so I could display it on my table. So instead, we're going to have a picture of pasta. Bam, here is pasta. And pasta is a problem because it is made from wheat. There is no meat pasta. There are no eggs pasta. There is no salad pasta. It's always wheat pasta or some other grain that's just almost as bad. But there are substitutes, and here is one of them. This is known as a spaghetti squash. Now, I have to confess, uh, being from Missouri, um, growing up in a Midwestern home, we never had spaghetti squash. But when I got into the low-carb thing, I quickly found out about it. Spaghetti squash is so much easier on your blood sugar than regular pasta. I mean, it is tremendously uh, superior to keeping your glucose levels down. So consider this. I made a, a video about it. We'll put a link in the description below. Another thing you can do would be what people call zoodles. They make a pasta out of zucchini, and that works as well. Now, I'm sure there are all kinds of other creative ways, but one way or the other, you have to avoid regular wheat-based pasta. Okay, another bad guy. Bread is not your friend. Let me say it again. Bread is not your friend. In fact, grains of almost all kinds are not your friend. And if you're serious about getting your glucose down, you're going to have to say goodbye to bread but there are some alternatives like so many other choices. So let's look at one of the alternatives, and that is low-carb bread. This is called solar bread. It's just one of many choices you can get these days. There was a time where you couldn't find this anywhere except online. Nowadays, the stores almost all carry at least one brand of low-carb bread, and that's good news for those of us that go that direction. This has, a, I believe, what, three? Yeah, three net grams of carbs for one slice. That means you could eat a sandwich, which normally, if I eat a sandwich at all, it's just with a layer of bread on the bottom, nothing on the top. But you could put two layers, top and bottom, and still you'd just be up to six grams of carbs. Make sure what's in between is okay, and you're probably going to be fine. When I became a low-carb guy, I gave up on one of my favorite lunch foods, which was the bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. And then I realized that I could take something like some of these low-carb breads, toast the bread, use only one slice, put a nice big slice of, of tomato, 
put some mayonnaise on there, put some bacon, put some lettuce, have a BLT, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, no problem. No problem for, for blood sugar. I was in good shape. So this is one choice. You can make your own bread, of course. You can use almond flour. And there are all kinds of recipes for low-carb almond flour bread uh, on YouTube and uh, across the internet. So if you want to make some of your own, just go to YouTube search engine, type in keto bread, low-carb bread, or go to Google, type in keto bread, low-carb bread. You'll find a thousand different ways to do it. All right, another bad guy. But this is not just any bad guy. This is the mother of all bad guys, the most dastardly, dastardly, evil, monstrous villain you could ever imagine. This is plain old table sugar. Now, bread comes a close second, but this is probably worse still. And it uh, there's <laughs> there's no glycemic to it. It just enters your stomach, enters your blood lightning fast, and there goes your blood sugar off to the races. If you ever want to get your glucose down anywhere close to normal, you will say goodbye to this monstrosity. But there is good news in that there are alternatives you can use, and that could be... And we have here a couple of sugar-free alternatives that are relatively natural. This swerve is made from erythritol, and uh, it is not going to raise blood sugar hardly at all. In fact, it says in the back of the package, zero net carbs, the ingredients in Swerve do not affect blood sugar. Well, they're either lying or they're not. I don't think they are, actually. They don't seem to, uh, it doesn't seem to affect my blood sugar. Here's another sweetener I use a lot. I ordered this in a, a box of a thousand of these packets. It's called Wholesome Organic Stevia. Got it from Amazon. And this is, it says stevia, but actually erythritol is the number one ingredient. And then stevia would be the number two. So it's a combination of erythritol, stevia, and that's fairly common. There are a number of brands that make this. And one of these in a, in a cup of coffee, smaller cup of coffee is just fine. A couple of these with your pancakes or to make a muffin uh, works just fine. They do not raise blood sugar like real table sugar would. For most of us mere mortals, uh, we like something sweet once in a while, and I know I do. And it keeps my diet sustainable and workable to where I'm not constantly looking over my shoulder and saying, oh, if only I could go back to the standard diet. All right, let's go to another bad guy, and that is, well, candy of all kinds. Here we have a particular candy bar. This is a Kit Kat candy bar. This particular bar is not all that big, has 28 grams of carbs, but you just can't afford it. Many of us are trying to keep our net carbs under 20 or around 20 for a whole day. So you eat one candy bar, you're over that. So instead, how about a low carb bar? <laughs> now I know this is going to get me some of the most meanest critical comments uh, that anything I'm, I'm talking about today will get because a lot of people don't like low carb bars. They, they think they've got too many ingredients and they probably do. And uh, they think they're unnatural because of all those different kinds of ingredients. And some people say, well, they still jack up my blood sugar too much. And there's all kinds of criticisms. What I will say is this, number one, first check with Mike and see if you can tolerate low carb bars. In my case, I can. And secondly, I rarely will eat an entire low carb bar. What I usually do is break them in half and I have one this day and then another uh, a day or two later. So I'm getting them a half bar at a time. Uh, if anything, I'm getting a very low dose of whatever is nasty about them, but they do not raise blood sugar for most of us. All right, moving on to another bad guy. And that is vegetable oil. Now, vegetable oil is different from all the other products I've been talking about because if you look on the back and look at the total carbohydrates in this vegetable oil, it is zero. So Mike is probably not going to hassle you about vegetable oil, but every person that I respect in the keto world who researches, who writes about keto and low carb they all think this is a disgusting product that is extremely harmful. Not this particular one necessarily, but any vegetable oil. Corn oil, oil mazola oil, canola oil, just all these vegetable oils. Uh, the process of, of crushing them 
and squeezing their little guts out to get what little oil they have. It's just an unhealthy process. And this is considered a fat that is unhealthy. You've heard of people say, well, I'm going for the healthy fats. Usually what they mean is none of this stuff. So instead, how about so here we have three different alternatives. One would be coconut oil. This is the preferred oil for the keto crowd. Everybody speaks highly of coconut oil, almost everybody. And then here's another choice, which is uh, the uh, classic olive oil. This is the, uh, you can buy uh, extra virgin oil and classic olive oil and dark olive oil, but really any olive oil is gonna be better than vegetable oil. And then here's a choice a lot of people don't think about, and that is butter. You can melt butter and, and put it in recipes or put it with eggs or different things, and uh, it will work as well. So if my counting is correct, I've given you 10 different bad guys and 10 different or more than 10 different substitutions that you can use that will be gentle on your blood sugar. But we have one bonus substitution I'm going to share with you right now. Let's go to that. A pumpkin pie. This time of the year, pumpkin pies are incredibly popular. A lot of people will go January through about October and never eat a pumpkin pie or a piece of pumpkin pie. But boy, come November, December, uh, November, December, they will really gobble up the pumpkin pie. Well, I have here a Walmart pumpkin pie. And uh, this pumpkin pie has 55 grams of carbohydrates, a lot of sugar and a lot of flour. And by the time you add that up, you are at an enormous level of carbs for your poor pancreas and metabolic system to process. So how about a low carb pumpkin pie? I took a look at the ingredients for making a pumpkin pie. I think it was from a Libby's recipe. And I said to myself, well, there's two big problems with that. One is just all the sugar you have to put in there. And two is the crust, which is you're going to have to come up with a flour wheat crust. And that's bad news. Lo and behold, I cut the carbs way down and came up with this baby. Now, I've said before, some of the substitutes you have to use aren't quite as good. Some are as good, some are better than the original. This is better. I like the filling better, and I love the crust. I'd say the crust is about a thousand times better than an old wimpy flour crust full of carbs, an almond crust. We'll have a, a, a link down in the description to a video Benedict and I made about how to do this amazing pumpkin pie.